I showed you this slide in my introductory lecture. Note that the Palad of Narmer is not Old Kingdom. It's considered pre-dynastic from the period before the regular dynasties of pharaohs began to be recorded. I've already talked about the Palad of Narmer, so farewell, pre-dynastic Egypt. All three of our required Old Kingdom works actually date from the Fourth Dynasty, 2613 to 2494 BCE. I added the dates to the slides you've already seen, so you may want to put this information into your workbooks, although I really hope that these dates are more specific than you'll need for the test. You do want to remember that pyramids are Old Kingdom, temples are New Kingdom, as is our buddy Hunifer. The Adamarna period is also New Kingdom, and so is King Tut's sarcophagus. They'll show up in my last two Egypt lectures. The Old Kingdom is where ha we're hanging out today. I've already talked about the role of pharaohs, especially in the Old Kingdom. They were viewed as semi-divine, the embodiment of Horus in life, destined to join with Osiris in the afterlife. As the individual responsible for ensuring that Maat, or justice and order, prevailed, the Egyptian pharaohs wanted to be seen as eternal, unchanging, unmovable. And this shows up in art from the Palad of Narmer through to the coffin of King Tut, and indeed beyond. These statues are both portraits of the fourth dynasty pharaoh Khafre. There is a little dispute about the Sphinx identity, but not much. The status statue on the right is not one of your required works. I'm going to use it to review stylistic conventions for portraying pharaohs since it offers such a clear and classic example of Egyptian sculpture. Note that this statue also showed up in the Khan Academy reading. The Khafre statue is carved from diorite, a very hard igneous rock, even harder than gray wacky, the dark gray sandstone used for the required statue of Menkor and Queen on the right. These hard stones were much more difficult to carve, but also more likely to endure, reflecting again the Egyptian focus on the eternal. So what was the function of these statues? Both were placed in the valley temples that stood adjacent to the pyramids. There they really had a dual function. On the one hand, they were places for the pharaoh's ka, or spirit, to reside after the pharaoh's first physical death. But these statues were also objects of worship. Remember, these now-dead pharaohs had fully joined the ranks of the gods. People came to the temples to worship them as gods, and indeed the priests uh, fed these uh, statues to bring offerings to living, that is, eternally living pharaohs. So what visual symbols of royalty and power do you see? You've probably figured out by now that I like to go to sites designed for elementary school students. So here's a quick guide to the feral power suit, which I've reproduced in your workbook. I've added a label for the nemes, the striped headdress that was one of the symbols of a pharaoh. The uraeus in the middle of the nemes is a roaring cobra with a flared hood. According to the Egyptian religion, a cobra guarded the gates of the underworld, warded off the enemies of the royal family, and guided the dead pharaohs on their journey through the underworld. In other words, the cobra was a symbol of the pharaoh's power over life and death. Note that Menkora does not have a uraeus. The flail and crook were traditional symbols of Osiris. They also symbolized the pharaoh's dual role as shepherd of his people and punisher of evildoers. Flails were used to whip animals and slaves. Archaeologists think that pharaohs shaved regularly. They didn't actually have beards, but Osiris had a beard. So for their statues and paintings, pharaohs donned false beards to show that they would unite with Osiris in the afterlife. And of course, in Egyptian statues, we see a perfect, vigorous body signaling the pharaoh's eternal strength and power. The elementary school version, however, looks like he needs a few trips to the gym. A side view of Khafre reveals still more iconography, another reason why I included this image even though it's not a required work. The carved figures that I've circled on the throne are lily and papyrus representing the united kingdoms of Upper and Lower Egypt. And on Khafre's neck, really fusing into his body, is the falcon symbol of Horus, Osiris' son, and the godly identity of living pharaohs. So here's a question that asks you to remember one of your summer works. How would you compare the two Egyptian sculptures with Polyclitus' canon, or the spear bearer? Specifically, how would you compare the Greek and Egyptian use of negative space? Well, there's very little negative space in 
uh, either Egyptian sculpture. Keeping the body compact, of course, made the, the job of carving extremely hard stone easier, but the highly compact composition of the Egyptian sculpture also fit with the Egyptian ideology. The Egyptians, after all, valued stillness, immobility and unchanging posture, the signs to them of an eternal but also unchanging afterlife. The Greeks, by contrast, valued agility, movement, grace, the signs of life on earth. We'll talk more about this in our next unit. Let me make just a few more comments about form. Both statues, and virtually all Egyptian statues, are frontal and bilaterally symmetrical. That is, they, pre they present mirror images across a vertical axis. Again, this perfect unrealistic symmetry adds to the sense of calmness and permanence that the statue is intended to convey. Contrast this again with the dynamic contrapposto posture of our friend the spear bearer. Now let's focus on the statue that is one of our required works. Menkera was Khafre's son. So what iconic elements do you see in this statue? We just see the symbols of power, the stillness, the young, perfect muscular body. Menkera's queen's body is rather perfect as well, and she is surprisingly tall. Most statues of Egyptian women depict them as small, even child-sized. The relative height of the woman in this statue has led some scholars to theorize that she may have been Menkera's mother rather than his wife. Apparently, queen mothers outranked wives. The statue is rigidly frontal as usual, and despite the seemingly affectionate pose, it really shows no emotion. The king doesn't even seem to notice that his wife or mother is there. Note, too, that both figures follow the convention of putting the left foot forward, which is not always done in uh, portraits of women, by the way. This conveys movement toward the afterlife, but otherwise, the statue retains the immobility and permanence of Egyptian statuary art. Like the Greeks and long before, the Egyptian artists followed a strict canon of proportion. This is a set of rules for the relative size of the body that all Egyptian sculptors were required to follow. So, for example, in order to show the left foot forward, the left leg had to be sculpted longer than the right leg. The Egyptian canon of proportions was a square grid of 18 units applied to a drawn standing human figure, allowing it to be reproduced in various sizes, but always anatomically proportionate. We will encounter other and different canons of proportion in this class. It's a term you should know. And indeed, these canons convey interesting information about what any given culture considers not only proportionate, but beautiful. I'm guessing that this statue shows up in our required works to remind us that a lot of Egyptian sculpture did not portray pharaohs and that Egyptian artists were able to produce much more naturalistic art when they were not bound by the very strict canons of pharaonic re representation. The work on the right is an old college board favorite that did not make the list. It portrays a hippopotamus hunt. A little hard to see, but while the hero, T, is portrayed using the various conventions of aristocratic males. The animals and the hunters are much more lively and realistic. So what was the seated scribe's function? Ah, Egyptian art is so easy. The answer is almost always the same. This was intended not for human eye, eyes, but for a tomb to contain the scribe's ka. As our Khan Academy scholars noted, the most striking aspect of this sculpture is the surprisingly expressive face, particularly the elaborately inlaid eyes. They're made from a piece of red vein white magnesite with a piece of rock crystal inserted. The result is amazingly lifelike, and so is the pot belly, although that may actually be a symbol of the scribe's membership in the upper classes and not a real representation of his physique. While scribes did not rank with pharaohs, they were important people in Egypt, partly because they required years of training. And finally, we get to pyramids. The first royal tombs were called mastabas, and they were succeeded by step pyramids, shown here. Note that the burial chambers were below, not inside the pyramid, and that the architect of the step pyramid is the first architect that we know by name. And alas, that is all I'm going to say about this fascinating development of the pyramids. If you're interested, the videos we're showing today in the next two days include segments on that history, and the links are up on Canvas. The Great Pyramids are the only wonders of the ancient world still standing. 
Originally, the pyramids were covered with smooth white limestone. So looking at today's pyramids is like seeing a modern house with the stucco or brick facing removed. The original pyramids would have shimmered in the sunlight, capped by an also pyramidal ben-ben that was probably covered with gold plate. I get frustrated enough trying to teach paintings or sculptures with what are in effect slides. It becomes almost impossible to get a solid impression of architecture this way. So let's turn to a video clip, and I'm sorry it's not in better condition, that will give you a panorama of this site and discuss the function of these extraordinary works. By the end of this clip, you should be able to answer the first basic question about the pyramids. What were their function? I warned you, right? This plan of the pyramid complex is also one of your required images. The diagram is actually a little confusing since north is not at the top as we're used to seeing and that's why I circled the directional indicator on the diagram. Once you know which way is north, you should see that the temple complex was built to the east of the pyramids facing the sun or the rising sun. The cult of the sun god Ray achieved greater prominence in this period and the orientation of the temples reflects this. Remember that old kingdom statues we were looking at earlier would have been placed in the temples, not in the pyramids. Scholars still debate just how the pyramids were constructed. Let's return to the video for a glimpse of some of these theories. The interior plan of the Great Pyramid of Khufu is not part of the required images, but I think it's worth a little study. Part of what makes the pyramids so remarkable is that they included rooms at their very center, tombs for the pharaohs and their entry point to the afterlife. The video continues with a glimpse of the interior of this pyramid. If you want to learn more about the other two great pyramids, feel free to watch more of the movie on your own. And by the way, it is possible for tourists to go into the heart of the pyramids. I don't recommend it if you're claustrophobic like my husband who took this photo but really did not enjoy the experience. And finally, we get to the weirdest and, my, to my mind, most wonderful element in the complex, the Sphinx. One last short video clip. And one last McConnell family photo. You may not have any time left, but just in case you do, I think today's lesson offers two excellent candidates for comparative analysis. So what do you think? How do the Sphinx and Lamassu compare in terms of function? content, context, and form. And what about the ziggurat top with a temple and the Great Pyramids? In my next lecture, excuse me, we will fast forward to the New Kingdom and move from pyramids to 